Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and today, thanks to Boston Motorsports in Brighton, Massachusetts, we're driving a 2021 Aston Martin DBX. And I have had some seat time in the DBX in the past, but it was a pre-production vehicle and it was really just a first taste of what it was capable of. Frankly, I was very impressed with the car, even though there was a lot of consternation about what it stood for for the Aston Martin brand. This is supposed to elevate. It's supposed to bring in the money. It's supposed to make Aston Martin a profitable company that doesn't need to get bought and sold constantly. This one is in intense blue. It's absolutely beautifully specced. And when we get inside, you're gonna love the deviated stitching and all the accoutrement inside. But frankly, this SUV, despite its very high cost, I think does the road SUV thing better than almost any other brand. Because Urus is a little extreme, but it's also just kind of an Audi with a lot of power. Whereas this has this incredibly long wheelbase with a low slung platform and even the rear seats are pretty comfortable because they're not elevated like like a stadium seat up above the front seats so even for your passengers this is a great place to be it utilizes the same Mercedes AMG four liter with two turbos, 542 horsepower coming from this beast into all four wheels. This one is on 22 inch wheels and it's made to grip. We've got 285s up front, 325s at the rear. But the real trick up the sleeve of the DBX is its comfort. This is a triple chamber air suspension that allows you to waft along with control and precision without sacrificing luxury. Back here, we've got our big hatch. It's kind of a funky opening. Everything is a little different on DBX. And then, of course, because it's an Aston Martin, you just got like leather littered all over the place in this thing. And there's always something to look at, whether it's the shape of the wheels or this kind of funky spoiler. And it does not have a rear wiper. And I remember when Aston Martin came out with this, they said, we don't need a rear wiper because the aerodynamic design is meant to wash away any water. Now, it probably doesn't help you in the snow, but we'll take their word for it. In the back, before we go up front, just to show you what the passenger compartment is like, First of all, you can tell they're aiming for comfort and luxury because you've got double plane glass on the front and rear. So this is a very quiet vehicle when it comes to road noise. And back here, even these seats in the rear are appointed beautifully. There's definitely a level of luxury in the craftsmanship that makes you know you've got something special. Now with my seating position up front, I have tons of room back here. It's a very comfortable place to be, but nothing fancy. It's kind of interesting. There's really no frills back here aside from a couple charging points and your HVAC system. So maybe you would expect more for about $200,000, except for the fact that you have this insanely large panoramic roof that lets so much light into the cabin. But when you take a look up front at the way this is set up, the way this is designed, it kind of screams sports car and the deviated stitching with the yellow really pops. I think this is a fun spec. And just like Vantage and DB11, it has the piston struts style doors. So it doesn't have like detent. You can kind of place the door wherever you'd like. Door handles, just like DB11 and Vantage. And then the design just gets more interesting because you've got sort of this empty hollow space down here to charge your phone, put a few other things in the cubby. I think that's really rad. And then the seats are really stylish with the connected headrest. So it does have a very sports car vibe. If you've got a DB11, this is gonna be really familiar to you. And if we wanna open the hood, because it's an Aston Martin, gotta jump over to the passenger side, not the driver's side. Now I don't know if that's intentional just to save money because they're you know, aiming to make right-hand drive vehicles because it is British, or if it's just like a little Easter egg fun thing to do. And if I can get this open for you, this big clamshell style hood. I mean, look at the design of the hood. There are some really crazy curves and lines in this hood. And I gotta say, that's very fun to have this thing open up the way it does. And under here, we probably have the best look at this four liter twin turbo, which is interesting. They label it as twin turbo and not bi turbo the way Mercedes AMG does it. Fine, I get yelled at if I say twin turbo. Aston Martin has literally written it on the cover. So you can take it up with them. But you actually get a better look at this engine in DBX than you do in pretty much any Mercedes AMG product. But none of it matters if it doesn't drive well. So let's go find out 
how it operates on sort of a dreary winter day here in New England, because this is the reality. You're buying a DBX as your daily driver, and we want to find out how it handles. To start our Aston Martin, we've done away, unfortunately, with this previous generation with the ECU, the Emotion Control Unit, which I loved being able to put the glass key into the dashboard. But we do still have a push to start button that illuminates in red. Down here we have all of our modes. And it's interesting because a lot of cars, they'll just have one mode button where you'd say, oh, I'm just gonna scroll through my modes. Whereas this has two mode buttons because you don't go through it in a cycle. You actually go up and down. I feel like that's a little extra. I'm not sure why they've done this. In addition to that, the infotainment screen. This is not a touch screen. None of that works. So you have kind of the old school Mercedes vibe where you've got to use the scrolly wheel to figure your way through. I do feel like that's a little bit of a concession at this price point, but whenever we're talking about Rolls Royce, Bentley, really high end kind of vehicles, there's always stuff like that in the cars that you're like, man, I could get this on a Honda. Why can't I get it in my $200,000 luxury car? It's just the way it goes. I don't really understand. In Sport Plus mode, of course. Sounds maniacal. To put it in gear, we've got to reach pretty far forward. If you don't have long arms, this might be a problem for you. I've seen some small ladies driving these cars and I imagine a three-point turn for them requires quite a bit of reach. Before we run out and do a zero to 60, I think it is absolutely valid to talk about how it is to just drive around at low speeds because this is supposed to be your sort of cushy daily. And this is where the car actually has so much beautiful character because I feel very connected. Even at low speeds, you can tell there's good body control, but it's absorbing things for me that are unpleasant. We're all warmed up, we're in Sport Plus, our suspension has done its thing. Let's roll into it and see how she handles. So one of the big complaints about this car was that for the money, it's not as fast as the Lamborghini Urus, but it isn't slow. We're not working with, you know, 300 horsepower here. We still have 540 horsepower to play with in this vehicle. And it is potent and it is alive and it's really plenty. You don't really need more. Although Aston Martin has just responded by creating the 707. There is now a 700 horsepower version of DBX, which I think is a great idea. I mean, it, there should absolutely be more options for people who want it, but in no way does this feel neutered or lame. It has plenty of power. how it's balanced because maybe it doesn't have outrageous power like some of its competition but what it does do is it puts it down well in a chassis that can absolutely handle every bit of it and encourages you to use it one complaint i do have is the brakes they are very functional when you dig deep into them but there's not a strong initial bite and you know, I would just like a little less luxury in the brakes, and it's just kind of a sign of a luxury car. You know, Range Rover does that as well with the SVR. I, I like a little more bite, but that's something you can just adjust with a pad choice. I mean, if you really want to go crazy, you put another pad on it, and it'll give you what you need. Let's head back to GT mode as we go over one of my favorite bumpy roads. Luckily, not torn up by all the plows, but certainly not a comfortable road. This is not a great place when you're in a Viper or a Lotus Elise or something, because this road does have some undulations that can unsettle a car and just transmit some unpleasant vibrations through the cabin. I think are designed for maybe a larger gentleman than I. 
which probably makes sense for the typical buyer. And they're not that plush. They're actually a fairly, you know, aggressively, I don't want to say hard, but they're not a plush seat. It's not like getting into a Bentley or a Rolls Royce, which maybe that's what you want. I mean, you are buying an Aston Martin. You're buying a sports car with luxury. But we'll go back to Sport Plus, which I wish was a little faster to do. Big cracks and bangs coming out of that exhaust. Fantastic to let you know that this is a sporty machine. A little bit of wiggle from the rear end, so it is wet. I would imagine in the dry, this is gonna hook up just fine. Probably never gonna experience the torque ripping that rear end away from you in the dry, but that's fine. Nine speed auto giving me the nice downshifts as I slow down, making sure that I'm in the power band. Make a gentle pass on this Subaru. And it certainly gets up and goes. I, I, I can see how when you go head to head with a Urus or an RSQ8, you might say, well, uh, there are faster vehicles out there for similar or less money. I gotta say though, I just really enjoy driving this car I find it to have a lot of character. I find that it it seems to not be chasing numbers in all of the right ways. And there are things like the infotainment system being a little dated and things like that, that I, I can absolutely see that being a deal breaker for certain people who just you know must have the touch screen, especially at that price point, I get it. But what I will say is this is a driver's car and I, I have to applaud Aston Martin for building a vehicle that is genuinely enjoyable to drive. Now, there are some fun Easter eggs in here, so let's go back into GT mode while we just kind of lumber along on the highway. If we hit, let's see, where is it? There we go. If we hit this button here for our distance control, for our cruise control, you will see a little Easter egg that is the silhouette of an Aston Martin DB5, I believe. It is so cool. You gotta have the little James Bond reference in the car. I really appreciate details like that. Maybe that's a little more of a Doug DeMuro thing, but to me, that makes me feel like I'm kind of part of the Aston Martin family when I get in it. Fuel economy is dismal. It's not good, it's actually really prominently bad. Uh, I've done 21 miles in the car so far. We've averaged 10.9 miles per gallon. I uh, mean, sure, maybe I'm driving with a little bit of a heavy foot, so if we were to just do a cruise, we might eke out like 17, 18 if we're really lucky. I'm not totally sure what the specs are, but yeah, it's, it's not phenomenal. You're gonna be drinking quite a lot of fuel in your DBX. control in this car, in this in this SUV, it's really competent. And I think that's what makes this thing so enjoyable to drive. Because when you get in a Range Rover, you get in a Urus, they still have that SUV vibe. This feels like a car that's just large. It's very strange. It's almost, it's not quite like getting in a Rapide, but still it, it, it has this sense of competence and body control and agility but also tactility because I can feel it. I can feel it in the steering which is really nice. 
that may not be as plush as the Range Rover, but it does feel luxurious and it does feel controlled. And that's really what I'm impressed with by Aston Martin with this vehicle, because I don't think it gets enough credit. People don't talk about this enough. I really enjoy it. And maybe, maybe it's just too expensive and look, I, I can't afford it. So I can't tell someone what to buy with their $200,000. But what I can say is that it's a good thing to drive. Steering wheel as well. They didn't put some big, chunky, obnoxious SUV steering wheel in it to be like, well, look, we're the you know, X5M competition. We want you to feel something. No, they, they just gave it like a normal sports car steering wheel. It feels like the proper size. You feel really comfortable if you're used to sports cars or GT cars when you get in it. And it has column mounted paddles, which I have really not touched because the nine speed transmission is doing a pretty good job of being where I need it to be. This is probably where you would live if you had one of these. You'd be out in the countryside, probably somebody with an apartment in the city and a nice house on many acres for the family and the dog. Not quite a farm vehicle, but it fits in out here. slippery right now and I did that because I wanted to see how it would transfer power to the wheels and it does such a good job of laying it down with no drama maybe you want a little more drama but I also don't feel like it's restricting me you know it's always disappointing I'm gonna go slow by this guy in case somebody whips around the corner with some gusto all right we're good to go uh, you know it doesn't feel like it's limiting me like it's just cutting power or anything hey check out the alpacas yeah, <laughs> that's what we want to see. We've got alpacas here. We've got a bunch of cows down there. Love to see it. This is great. I don't know if they like the sound of that engine, but if they do, hopefully it comforts them. But it does a good job of sorting things out without limiting you in an unpleasant way. Sorry, I keep getting distracted by things, but you know, alpacas are dope, so. Love the launches on this, it's so much fun. a little early, very slippery. Good communication from the front wheels. Really not concerned about understeer. There's a car just dead over there. Okay. A little bit of a pucker moment, hoping that wasn't uh, a friend I didn't want to meet today. That's fine. Anyway, that's the DBX, guys. I think this is a really lovely thing to drive. I can't afford it, so maybe that opinion doesn't mean much because it's $200,000. But if you like the style, if you want a comfortable car that really does what it says it was going to do, this is the thing. It's actually really great. Things I would change. I would like a more Aston Martin infotainment-based system. This feels very much like, a, okay, we just gotta do something. We'll use the, the UX from, or UI from Mercedes-Benz, sure. You know, I get it, I get it. You gotta, you gotta save money somewhere and this is supposed to be kind of the saving grace for the company financially. That's fine. It would have been really cool to have like analog gauges in this thing because maybe if you're not gonna have the full blown experience with the most up to date modern touch screens, we need to upshift. This is this is silly. Maybe you just go with full analog. I mean, how insane would that have been if all the other options in the fleet, Urus, RSQ8, G Wagon, I mean it's not really a G Wagon competitor, but still, instead of having this kind of display, an LCD display, you just went with like old school analog gauges. I mean, imagine that, that would have been great. But I can't have everything. Maybe I'm just an old man and that's fine. 
Thank you guys so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Thank you to Boston Motorsports for the opportunity to get a taste of the DBX on some real world conditions, on some real roads in some not perfect weather. Definitely some slippery stuff out here, so it's perfect to test what it's really like to drive. Don't forget to respect the drive, and I'll see you in the next one.